Good morning, and welcome once again to the house of the Lord. Because wherever we are, as we gather together with God and his word, it is the house of the Lord. May God bless our worship this morning. And we begin our worship today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As is our custom, and it is a very good custom, we begin our worship with our confession of sin to God and his promise of forgiveness. Today I'd like to do that by reading the first five verses together with you of Psalm 32. So if you'd like to pause this, find a Bible, read this with me with your family. We read Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. We do know what it is to carry guilt. Sometimes that guilt is public. Very often that guilt is private, and yet it is heavy. But the forgiveness of that guilt, we know that too. Because it is God's promise to us that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And so once again, I assure you, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is God's truth. And it is the beauty of God's truth that, that brings us together today, and we're going to focus on today as we study Scripture and as we hear Christ speak of what truth truly is. Let's begin with prayer. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts this day be pleasing in your sight, Lord God, Heavenly Father, for you are the King of heaven and earth, our Creator and Redeemer. Lord, sanctify us with your truth, your word is truth. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, this week has been different. Um, in many ways, because of what we're going through, it's been different for me um, in a couple of different ways. As we've been gathering together for morning devotions and Sunday worship via the internet, um, I posted my first YouTube video this week, something I thought I would never be able to say. I did it, with a little help, but I did it myself. Went on Facebook for the first time and I don't know how long. Got my first like on Facebook. I've been hearing all about like us on Facebook, I got one. Also got my first dislike on Facebook. I don't know if that's what it's called, but you know what it looks like, that's that thumb down that jumps out at you from the screen, that you wish you didn't see but you can't ignore, that thumbs down that has tattooed itself on the inside of your eyelids and wakes you up at 2.30 in the morning wondering why. Why? My mind went to a thousand different places. First, it, it, it must have been a mistake. I mean, who would dislike a church service? Maybe it was an accident. Maybe they meant to press like. But then it progressed. You know, maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I said something wrong. Went looked back at it two, three times. Didn't say anything wrong. Maybe it's the way I said it. Maybe it's how I presented it. I don't know. But I got to do it again tomorrow. So what am I going to do? How am I going to make it right? How am I going to fix it? A little neurotic, yes. But as I, during this week in which we already have way too much time to think about stuff, as this was weighing on my mind, something occurred to me. Um, something meaningful, I hope I remember. And that is that the unbelievable power that public opinion can have over what we perceive reality to be and then how we act in accordance with what our perceived version of reality is. It's a frightening thing, what it can cause you to think and what it might even cause you to do. So no, I didn't like it. But in a way, I'm glad I got my first dislike because it allowed me to connect with this text in a way I never had before. Seeing the danger of public opinion and what it can cause somebody to do, what it can cause you and I to do. 
or in our sermon text for today, what it caused those people in Jesus' day to do. And it's that whole concept of public opinion that really drives uh, the, 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 the text here. Not what Jesus says, but everything around him. Public opinion. It's what's caused Pilate to ask this very famous question of Jesus. What is truth? Who's to say what truth is? This person, that person, the masses? But Jesus very calmly, very lovingly says that truth lies in him. And if we want to know what truth is, we listen to him. So I want to read this portion of scripture to you today. And again, if you would follow along, please do. It's taken from John chapter 18. We'll begin with verse 29. Pilate came out to them, the crowds, and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. We well, are a king then said Pilate. Jesus answered, You're right in saying I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate replied. This is God's word. What is truth? A very famous question that Pilate asks and that has been quoted that, in a way, summarizes the ideologies of the world at, at various points in time, I believe where we live right now. What is truth? There is no truth except for what the masses choose to be truth. What is truth? What everybody likes, that's truth. And it's sad how that can change. If something we hold to be dear suddenly becomes unliked by the majority of society, it becomes a bad thing. Or if something that we dislike and disapprove of becomes widely accepted, then it becomes a good thing. Public opinion can be a very powerful sense of reality. Not reality itself, but a perception of reality. And it's what drives the people next to Jesus in our text. You have Pilate, of course, but you also have those people who have sought to have Jesus killed. You have the Jewish leaders, the majority at least of the Jewish leaders, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, those who made up the Jewish ruling council known as the Sanhedrin. They wanted Jesus dead. Why? In short, because they had lost face because of him. To use the analogy that I began with, they had those likes from the people. The people loved them before Jesus came. They respected them. They looked up to them. They thought, these are the people we want to be. These are the people we need to listen to. And then Jesus came along. And the people began to realize that, that the truth of God, that the love of God didn't reside in these people, it resided in him. And as Jesus' popularity grew, their popularity began to shrink. And they hated him for it. Public opinion. It didn't matter to them that Jesus was innocent. And they knew he was. They knew he didn't do anything wrong. They recognized that he was an innocent man. They didn't recognize him to be God, but as a man, he really had committed no crime. That wasn't the point. The reality of it isn't what mattered. What mattered was what the people thought. And they wanted to rally the people to once again like them. It was jealousy. Even Pilate called him out on it. It was jealousy that, that brought Jesus before him. And yet they tried to sway public opinion. They, they handpicked this large group of people and rallied them to cry against Jesus one by one until with one voice they shout, crucify him, crucify him. 
The people of that crowd were swayed by what? By the people around them. And the people leading the charge because of what they wanted to believe. They wanted to believe that Jesus needed to be gone. And that when Jesus was gone, things would once again be right. They would once again be on top and the world would be a better place. That was their reality. It wasn't true. But that's what they had led themselves to believe. Now Pilate... He knows it's not true. He knows Jesus is innocent. And you've got to give Pilate a little bit of credit on the outset because he does seem to hold what would be a fair trial. He begins to ask the crowd what Jesus had done. And notice their answer. They don't even really bring a charge. They simply say, if we had not, or if he was not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. There's no charge. Just simply, just trust us. He's a criminal. He deserves to die. Pilate sees right through this. He questions Jesus. Jesus, of course, though, doesn't try to defend himself. And so what can Pilate do? Well, Pilate could do what the, the right thing to do, to recognize the truth that was before him and set Jesus free. But again, public opinion was pretty heavy. The public around him wanted Jesus dead. The public around him said that Jesus was treasonous. The public around him said that Jesus deserved to die. And only one person suggested otherwise, Jesus, by his innocent silence. Public opinion won the day. Because he was afraid of Caesar, who was moved by the people, and if the people's cry reached him, he would be in trouble. And so the reality wasn't the important thing that day. It was the perception of reality. And Pilate caved. Pilate looked for a way out of this. But in the end, he washed his hands and handed Jesus over. But not before Jesus told him what truth really was that he had come to testify to the truth so that the world would not be burnt by the truth, but the world might be saved by the truth. And if anybody really wants to know what the truth is, they listen to him. See, Pilate and, 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 and the, the crowds there are not that much different than the world today. You know, we can, can look at the world around us and paint a picture of what we want it to be. And if we want it to be that way strongly enough and we get enough support, we can change what we perceive reality to be. Very specifically, you know, there, there are certain things that, that we hold to be dear. God and his laws and, and what he wants of us, the rules that he places for us. But if the world starts to hate those things, then in public view, those things become bad and we who hold on to them are the criminals. Or those things that we hate, those things that we know to be wrong, that God knows to be wrong, if the world embraces them, if the world as a whole says that they are good, then we who claim that they are bad are judgmental. And again, the criminals. Public opinion is such a powerful thing in that it can sway the perception of those who listen to it and who seek truth in it. But is it truth? You know, if I want something to be, to be true, does that make it true? I'll give you an example. Um, just the other day, by the other day, I mean last summer, I was running with my son, and um, we were running a race. We were training for this race, and we like to talk a little trash. It's a little fun. Oh, I'm going to smoke you. I'm going to leave you in the dust. And we trained for this, and I, in my mind, was kind of hyping myself up because I've been running for decades. I was a pretty good runner, and I'm still fairly strong. I've got some endurance, and he's just a little fella. So I was going to win. That was my truth. That was my perception of reality. But it wasn't reality. The reality occurred when our feet side by side hit the pavement. And then reality came crashing in. As I see him quite literally running backwards laughing at me. Good for him. Bad for me. Because I had painted a picture of reality that wasn't true. And it came back to bite me. We, we, can, we can tell ourselves that things are true all day long. But truth eventually will reveal itself. And if what we've been holding to our whole lives is not true, we'll get burned by that. That's why Jesus came into the world, he says. The very reason he was born was to testify to the truth so that we wouldn't get burned by it, so that we would be saved by it. And everyone on the side of truth listens to me. We want to know what truth is, then we listen to him. So what does he say? What is the truth that Jesus teaches? 
Well, we could point to a number of different passages in Scripture. I'm just going to point to a couple, and I want to start with this. With John chapter 8, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. There's two parts here. Jesus puts them very simply. We're going to expand on them a little bit. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, no slave has a permanent place in the family. What he's saying is that if we sin, and we do, that's the reality of it then we are bound by that sin, we are owned by that sin, and we do not have a place with God. A couple of other places he speaks about this, in the positive and in the negative. In Luke chapter 10, somebody comes and asks Jesus, he says, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life, to have a place in God's family? Jesus says, well, what's written in the law? What does the Bible say? He replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. Love God perfectly, love your neighbor perfectly, be good all the time and you will live. If you don't, he says in Matthew chapter 5, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and experts in the law, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In short, unless you do this perfectly, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The only alternative is hell. Jesus says it very simply. If you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have got to be perfect. And you and I aren't. And that's a hard truth. It is truth, but it's a hard truth. And I understand why some people don't want to believe that, because it's a terrible truth. I'm, I'm a sinful human being, and to hear God say that as a sinful human being, I have no place in his family, is something I would rather not be true. But doesn't make it not true. But that's not the only truth that Jesus teaches. He teaches us that we are all sinners and that we all deserve to be kicked out of God's family or to be left out of God's family for eternity. But he also teaches this. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And that's why he came. That's why the Son came to set us free. Or as he says in Matthew chapter 20, the Son of Man, Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's why he was standing before Pilate this day. Not because the crowds drove him there. He let it happen. Not because Pilate was a little wishy-washy. Jesus stood there on his own volition. But he stood there to give his life as a ransom for mankind. In a few short hours, unbeknownst to Pilate, what, what was going to happen was going to be done as a payment for mankind. Jesus was going to be paying for the guilt of humanity. Jesus was going to be punished by God to buy us back, to make us free, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, but that we would be owned by him. That's why he came. And that's the truth that he came for us to know. One last passage that summarizes it very beautifully. John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. That last section of that last verse is the danger of public opinion. Public opinion that values our thoughts and the world's thoughts over God's thoughts. He says, whoever does not believe in him stands condemned already, because they have not believed in God's reality. They have not believed in God's truth. That's the danger. And yet, let's go back to the truth. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Friends, I'm a sinner, and so are you. And yet that sin has been removed. And when we stand before the courtyard of God, the throne of God, God says, you already know what the verdict is going to be. Not guilty. That's the truth that Christ came to this world to bring. 
And that's the only truth that truly matters. Not what the world says, not what I say, not what I think, not what you feel, but what Christ says. Because in his words are salvation and forgiveness and life. And God says, I love you. Let that be the one truth that holds you and guides you and keeps you calm and safe. Let that be the one thing that you care about. The rest doesn't matter. To be liked on Facebook, to be unliked on Facebook, to be loved, to be hated. What truly matters is where you stand with God and you know where you stand with God because God has told you. He loves you. He's forgiven you. And he holds us close now and in eternity. Let that be the one thing that is tattooed on our eyelids at 2.30 in the morning. My God loves me. Because that is true. Amen. And now may that peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. In our prayers today, we say a prayer on behalf of Andrew Bublitz. Andrew is the son of Richard and Audrey, and perhaps you remember about five years ago we prayed uh, regularly for Andrew who received a heart and a double lung transplant and has been living a very productive life. Recently he was thought to be diagnosed with the coronavirus. Um, he has turned up negative, hallelujah for this, but does have a very severe case of pneumonia and because of his pre-existing conditions it is a very dangerous thing. And so we pray that God gives him healing and comfort to the family. And we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for all of the gifts that you give us. Gifts that are hard to recognize sometimes at first. Those gifts that are joyful and fun. 